Before I hit play, I wanna let you know that this video is sponsored by Blue Apron. I recently partnered with them on a cooking video. Can't handle the heat, get out of the kitchen. Mm. Since we filmed that video, I've become even a bigger fan of Blue Apron, and I've seen the very positive comments you guys have left down below in that video and are enjoying the service too. So I wanna extend their offer. The first 100 people who click the link in the description box will get $50 off their first two weeks of Blue Apron. It's healthy ingredients that are delivered right to your door. The recipes are already pre-planned for you, so for someone like me, who's a novice chef and doesn't really know how to cook, it makes the process a lot easier. I always say the most important important thing is to be in charge of your health, and one of the major ways to do that is to know what goes into your body. I was probably four years old when the show came out. So a lot has changed in medical practice, but I think it's gonna be kind of cool to show how we've evolved in our medical practices. The colors are accurate. It looks like this could have been filmed today. I think that probably has something to do with the fact that hospitals haven't been updated in decades in their appearance. Me, you ain't seen nothing yet. It's never a good idea to take the cap off the syringe with your mouth. Cause what if it flicks off and then you end up stabbing yourself in the face? Not a good idea. I get sometimes in a trauma situation people do it. There's no rush to be had here. So take it off with your hands, throw it in the sharps bin, make sure you don't stab somebody and get a needle stick. Your hand is still attached, not by much, but it's gonna be okay. Never a fan of promising patients results. I understand in a trauma situation, you need to calm people down because when you calm them down, heart rate drops and you have a better chance of survival. But I just wouldn't give false promises. I would say, you know, we're taking great care of you. We're working on saving your hand. The best thing you can do for, for us right now is to relax. All right, battle. let's go people. That's a shockable rhythm. Let's go, this is the world fair. Let's move. Here we go. Nice and easy. Clear. He just literally put one of the um, paddles on the top of her chest and the other one will look like on her like abdomen to shock her. It's not the way you do it. You have to do it on the chest area. I can't stand it. We'll give you something for the pain. Just hold on. Notify oh. the orthopod we have an open fracture. Oh. Okay. Give him tetanus and five of morphine right away. The reason why they say specifically open fracture, that means that your bone has broken and has penetrated out of your skin. So that's dangerous for two reasons. Number one, high chance of infection because you have an open wound. Second, because sometimes the bone can put pressure uh, on your blood vessels and therefore uh, cause something known as claudication, which means that you're not getting enough circulation to a part of the bone, a uh, part of the body, and then that area can swell and it could be very dangerous and you need emergent surgery for that. And then on top of it, you could obviously lose a lot, a lot of blood because you have an open fracture that you need to get closed and reduced. Go back for me, baby. Come on back to us. Come on, baby. I don't know where his hands are in that scene. Just because you're seeing the electrical activity look good on the monitor, you have to feel for the pulse. If you don't feel a pulse, that can just be pulseless electrical activity. It means that the heart has rhythm, but, and the electricity is there, but the heart's not completely beating properly to get the blood flow going throughout your body. Patient's still cardiac arrest. It means you have to keep going with your uh, advanced cardiac life support. My father had a heart attack, and we were unable to revive him. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Bastard. Bastard. You're sorry. I sort of get what this patient's going through. I mean, I've lost family members before, but it's also inappropriate to be physical with any healthcare professional, doctor, nurse, PA, anybody. The one thing that z Dog does a really good job on, you could check out his channel, he, he also makes really good medical videos. He stands up for healthcare worker abuse, and we really need to put more attention to that because it's contributing to doctors burning out, nurses burning out, increasing rates of suicide in the healthcare profession field because while this patient lost his one father and he's acting this way, it's understandable, but this doctor is gonna see 20, 30 patients like this and if they all do this, you're not gonna last a very long time practicing, especially if you're working five, six days a week. Orderly, please. Oh, paper charts. 
I haven't touched a paper chart in ages. You worked 36 hours on, 18 off, which is 90 hours a week, 52 weeks a year. For that, we are paid $23,739 before taxes, and we also have to make the coffee. My heart is breaking. Residents nowadays make somewhere in the range of, I would say 40 to 65,000, depending where your program is, what kind of program it is. Now there's hour restrictions in place where interns especially can only work 16 hour shifts at a time. You have to have certain amount of hours in between your shifts. There's weekly caps. As I mentioned in my Grey's Anatomy review video, the Libby Zion Law in New York State uh, started this trend of instituting hourly caps on residents and it spread to all 50 states at this point. Dr. Green, your wife is waiting in the cafeteria. Dr. Green, your wife is waiting in the cafeteria. We still have pagers and sometimes you can send the messages to your phones, but the reason why that we're trying to reduce the amount of pages overhead is to allow patients to rest and sleep. If you think about it, who's in the hospital? Sick people, people who need to get better. How do they get better? Through rest, because body heals itself. If you constantly have pages going on overhead, it's very difficult for a patient to sleep. Oh no, would you look at this? That's the first tailored white coat I've ever seen. This is really funny. So Noah Wiley, this actor, people tell me all the time how much I remind them of him. I probably get that more than I get the whole McDreamy thing, even though the McDreamy thing is a running joke, but people say I look so much like him. This first comment that I see of them is them making fun of the fact that he has a tailored white coat, and I actually have a white coat that's very fitted, and my nurses and my colleagues always make fun of me, like, ooh, look at Dr. Mike with his fancy white coat. I just I just think it's important to look professional, look clean, and you know, suit it up as a doctor. You know, you work hard, you wanna preserve this image of professionalism, so I don't think it's a bad thing. And I know they're gonna pick on him, because. I've experienced people picking on me about it. An angiocath with a 16 needle. You need a large bore in case they're bleeding and you need to transfuse them. Do you know how to start an IV? Uh, actually, no. I thought you were third year. I am, but all I've done is dermatology and psychiatry. As a medical student, in your first two years, you're pretty much in the classroom and just learning the curriculum, everything you need to know about the human body. In your third year, you start doing your clinical rotations, especially your cores, family medicine, internal medicine, surgery. It's not unusual for a third year to come in and not know how to do an IV. And generally, they're trained by either senior students or young residents or interns. It's scary being on your rotation for the first time. The, the way that I came about it and I had some success was that I came very, very excited to learn. And I wanted to learn how to do IVs. I wanted to learn how to do procedures. And anything that somebody would let me do or let me watch or let me practice, I would be the first to volunteer. I wouldn't try and steal opportunities from other people because I don't want to be a gunner. And a gunner is a person who tries to put other people down and get themselves ahead at all costs, even if it hurts someone else. I wasn't one of those people, but I was very motivated. And if you're a medical student and you want to shine on rotations, be motivated. Okay, man, we're going to push on the next one, okay? Well, well, well. One, two, three. The best way to deliver a baby is during the contractions, you should tell the patient to push and you want them to hold the pressure for the push as much as possible. And then if there's time, they can exhale, gather their strength and push again while the contraction is going on. Pushing while the contraction is not going on is not ideal because the uterus is not contracting the baby out. Therefore, you're not going to have any real success in getting the baby out. That is not a newborn baby. <laughs> That's a very large baby, you can tell. So now what we do in the hospitals is if the baby's crying and the baby's breathing, the first thing we do is right away put the baby on the mom's breast. That has shown the best results. Uh, bonding with the baby is very important. It calms the mother down, it calms the baby down. It's one of the uh, things that we're really pushing in all the major hospital systems. Oh, there it is, nice and red. Yes, otitis media, you'll be fine. Otitis media is a very common ear infection in young children. Uh, it's when the middle ear becomes infected with a, usually a bacterial infection. You do need antibiotics for it because uh, it can actually spread to the local tissues, to the bone. There's a part of the, uh, of the skull called the mastoid process and you can get mastoiditis there. It can be very dangerous, especially when a baby's so young and fragile, especially in the early days of life. Everyone has a family, Mark. My wife wants to shop, kids grow up, you want a private school, college, you gotta think about that. Now, the office for our next associate, 
is here. The constant dilemma for ER physicians is that you often work very long hours. The hours that you do work are very stressful. You're seeing a lot of patients. There's a, a high stress rate in this type of job because you never know what kind of patients you're gonna get. What this doctor is essentially offering, Dr. Green, is to leave the ER, work as an outpatient physician, where he would have a little bit more flexibility, a little less stress, better lifestyle, but he's not practicing the type of medicine he seems to want to practice and he dreamed of practicing. So it's always a decision that I see my colleagues struggle with that do they want the intense excitement of working in an ER setting or do they want something more uh, suitable to their lifestyle that they can start a family, be attentive to their family, have a more set schedule with weekends off. If you are really passionate about a specific uh, field of medicine, you can't imagine doing anything else. So I can totally see Dr. Green saying no to this and saying I would prefer to work in the stressful ER because that's where his passion lies. Are you afraid to tell me the truth? Your history of coughing blood, weight loss, and this x-ray is suggestive of cancer. But the diagnosis has not been confirmed and it may very well be something else. And none of us should jump to any conclusions until we know. That's what I think. How long do I have? Six months to a year. No doctor could look at an x-ray and from the x-ray just make a, uh, a guess of how long a patient has from life expectancy standpoint without a biopsy, bronchoscopy, without a CAT scan even. What she was doing in the first place was correct. You have to tell them that what you suspect it to be, give your differential, explain the next step in treatment, but not to give him a life expectancy. That's wrong. It's gonna be inaccurate. Can you tell me how long has it been since you've had your last period? I don't know. Well, just think back, tell me roughly. It was after Christmas. Okay. So it's been a few months. I guess so. I haven't really paid attention. And you've had sexual intercourse? Yes. Dr. Carter, what you have is an ectopic pregnancy and she needs to be scheduled for ultrasound and surgery right away. What is going on right now? He asked her when her last period was. She says she wasn't sure, maybe a few months ago. He asked if she had sexual intercourse. She said yes. And he just makes a diagnosis of an ectopic pregnancy without doing a physical exam. This is just this is so inaccurate. You may suspect an ectopic pregnancy from doing a physical exam and getting a full history, but you don't diagnose someone with that. That's just, it's wild. She could have so many other things. She could have, because it's left lower sided abdominal pain, it could be something with her stool. She could have a lot of gas. Uh, she could have diverticulitis, obviously not so common in her age group. Even sometimes appendicitis, which normally happens on the right side, can present with lower left sided abdominal pain. She could also have uh, a cyst in her ovary that could be causing discomfort. So to just say that she has an ectopic pregnancy from that, oh my God, that's so wrong. What are you people standing around for, huh? Do the arterial stick. She got a Babinski? Yeah. So a Babinski reflex is when you stroke uh, the bottom of the sole of the foot with a sharp object, not a very sharp object, with like uh, a pointy object, like the back of a reflex hammer. And if you stroke upwards, the toes in an adult are supposed to flex downwards as if they're grabbing the object. If they extend away and the big toe goes up, that's actually a sign of uh, central nervous system damage. And in times of an overdose, that could be a very bad predictive sign. How did this happen? He fell out of his crib. He fell out of his crib. Yeah, he, he was crying all night, so I brought him here. I bet he's been crying. When did he fall? I don't know. I get into trouble. And your son has multiple He's contusions. Not my son. I, you know, whatever. So, a young child with multiple bruising, multiple contusions is very uh, suspicious for child abuse and it would need to be screened by Children and Family Services. Another thing that makes us suspicious about child abuse is 
fractures in, in different stages of healing. Also a child that is scared to talk in front of their parents uh, could be an early sign. Uh, speak in front of their parents could be an early sign because they're hiding how they got their injuries and lying to you to try and cover up for their family. A very unfortunate common death in children, especially young infants, like six months of age, three months of age, is shaken baby syndrome, where after crying for a very long period of time, frustrated parents will shake their baby very hard to get them to stop and actually cause severe spinal and or brain damage, which causes the baby to stop breathing and die. It's horrible when this happens. I've seen this happen. So that's why I always uh, screen my parents, my parents, my parents, my patients who are parents to find out how they're doing in raising their child, if there's any symptoms of depression, if they're overly stressed out, because then I try and get them help and give them some stress management techniques and really tell them what to do in case that they're feeling these emotions creep in so they don't make a horrible mistake like that. He was standing, blocking traffic, but he's got that smell, so I thought I'd check. You, you did the right thing. We got a diabetic ketoacidosis, let's go. Very commonly, folks who are in diabetic ketoacidosis, which means that their blood sugar is so high, their blood is becoming acidotic and all the functions, all the cellular processes that go on in your body start collapsing and breaking down and you can die from diabetic ketoacidosis. And what this uh, police officer is saying is he got that smell on him is because you have a very fruity aroma when you're going through diabetic ketoacidosis. It's a very distinct smell that if you've smelled it before, you know exactly what the police officer is talking about. That feeling when you go to sleep and you know you have a couple hours to nap when you're on call. Oh my God, those are the most precious hours because your eyes are just closing and you're just exhausted. But it feels so good, even like 30 minutes of sleep, it's really important to prevent you from going crazy. 6.30, Dr. Green. <laughs> and it really does feel like that. <laughs> You slept 10 seconds and it's been two hours. ER is a classic, it's well written, it's well produced. I really could see myself binge watching this show. I mean, I watched this show when I was like eight, nine years old, but now being a doctor, it's cool watching this and learning uh, how they did certain things back in the 90s, what problems they had. So if you wanna binge this show, it's actually available on Hulu right now. Like I always say, if you have any recommendations or you have some questions, jump into the comment section, because you know I respond, if not down there, in my monthly responding to comments video. As always, stay happy and healthy.